<laughs> Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Mi Jin Yin, and I'm the head of the Department of Architecture. And I wanted to really welcome everyone to the 22nd Pietro Belusky uh, lecture hosted by the Department of Architecture. Pietro Belusky was trained as an architect and civil engineer and served as the dean of the MIT School of Architecture and Planning from 1951 to 1965. Late in his life, Dean Belusky and his family made a generous gift to MIT, establishing the annual Belusky Lecture. The roster of these distinguished lecturers have included Eduardo, Catal Eduardo Catalano, Alvaro Siza, Renzo Piano, Maki, Sejima, Zamthor, and last year, Liz Diller. Belusky's modernist structures were well known for their technological innovation. From the brutalist concrete frame of the Juilliard building at Lincoln Center to the first completely sealed active air-conditioned environmental system for the Equitable Office Building in Portland, Oregon in 1947. When selecting the 22nd Belusky Lecturer, we sought an architect who could live up to the Belusky legacy and found an architect who has and continues to be someone that challenges, complicates, elevates, and changes the discourse around architecture and technology. It is my great honor to have the opportunity to introduce architect Jeannie Gang. In a way, Jeannie Gang of Studio Gang needs no introduction. She is one of the very, very, very few architects who has won a MacArthur Genius Award. When she received the award in 2011, uh, it had been over a decade since uh, the previous architects, Sam Mockby and Diller Scafidio, received it. In addition to the MacArthur, she's received numerous awards, including the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award, the New Generation Leader Award from Architecture Record, and many AIA project awards. She's taught at Harvard, Yale, IIT, Princeton, and Rice. Jeannie founded the practice of Studio Gang in 1997 and has grown to a firm of 80 plus architects in Chicago and New York. Uh, Studio Gang's current and recent projects include the Arcus Center for Social Justice and Leadership in Michigan, Northerly Island in Chicago, the Boathouse in Clark Park, Campus North Residence Hall at the University of Chicago, and several towers in San Francisco, Miami, New York, and of course, Chicago. Studio Gang's work is always fresh. There's no predetermined style or syntax, each project emerging from the particular constraints and opportunities of the site and situation. The studio's practice is incredibly wide-ranging in scale, from installation, pavilions, to towers, and most recently, islands. Her practice straddles and engages these scales, allowing reciprocities to influence the aesthetic and technical possibilities of built form. Her practice values in-depth research into construction and fabrication possibilities, material innovation, and commercial necessities, which enables her architecture to be constantly involved in this dialogue with technology. From exploiting the seams between concrete pores, reinventing a log barn by stacking logs the wrong way, and recognizing the potentials of a flexible pour stop in a concrete slab building like the Aqua Tower. A small anecdote to shed some light about the chatter created by Studio Gang's work. A few years ago, a thesis project was conducted to analyze Aqua Tower's geometries. Students wanted to verify if the contouring of the floor plates did in fact produce self-shading and view optimization cited as the motives of the tower. In the process, the students produced dozens of alternative aqua towers, each driven by more and more engineered performance criteria. This thesis created quite a stir. Did the floor plates contribute to self-shading? Yes. Was it a sustainable high rise? Arguable. How is, it, how is sustainability measured? Debatable. Were the alternative versions more technically efficient? Maybe. Were they as elegant as the original? No. Is there value in the cumulative effect of a technical detail on the overall design? Yes. 
And lastly, what is the value of the image of a building? After intense debate, it was concluded that the architect's responsibility is not simply to find the most optimal technical solution, but rather to have the judgment to be able to weigh the real qualities of design, balancing technical performance, use, aesthetics, economics, and the cultural impact of a building. The Aqua Tower is simultaneously a building technology, an icon, and a real estate product. The Aqua Tower is discursive without being didactic. It is enigmatic and full of contradictions, and it reignited the tall building back into architectural discourse. Studio Gang's work is fresh and real because it lies at the intersection of the materially explorative, formally, formally speculative, and technically research, while being grounded in the world of it can be realized, financed, and constructed. After all, an architect is not an engineer, nor an image maker, nor a builder. An architect, as Jeannie Gang so elegantly demonstrates, is an orchestrator of all these competing forces, balancing or unbalancing them to produce architecture with a capital A. Please join me, join me in welcoming Jeannie Gang. Thank you, Mijun. That was very, very nice introduction, and um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I think one of the things that's debate going on right now in architecture is really whether um, architects should be thinking about the medium alone and, and focusing on, on becoming an architect using the tools that we can and building cities, for example, um, which it's true in and of itself that could take a lifetime to perfect and to, to master, or if the architect should be um, working outside the medium and inside the medium and trying to um, connect those dots and, and being engaged, let's say, in the space outside of our own discourse. And I guess for me, I fall into the second camp. Um, this is a, an image of a, a site right outside the city of Chicago that's not really hilly, that's actually a landscape but this classic post-industrial um, landscape that is really a polluted space that's starting to define um, our post-industrial cities. Um, I think that we, as architects, have a lot to offer in terms of the way that we think um, and the way that we can communicate. And so it's, they're not mutually exclusive, but it, it does take design. Design is the thing that it is the engine that helps us be powerful communicators. So you, you can't be one without the other. But I do think that we should be leveraging our, our talents and our work and our voices towards solving some of these most intractable problems today. So um, you know we are a firm that is lo uh, located across from this wig shop um, about. 80 people in Chicago and then in New York. The contrast is incredible. In New York, we're down on Wall Street. <laughs> but um, but we, we have, we're an organization that uh, works together in both of those locations. So I think there's also a, an aspect of understanding that uh, to be effective as, as a designer, you have to be somewhat organized. And so as our firm has grown, we designed our um, organization chart which is really in, in the form, instead of a pyramid, it's more like a tree. And this whole idea is that we are um, organized based on a mentoring model so that you know, my position is down in near the roots, uh, but, but every single person that comes into the office is able to become a strong branch and is responsible for the people that uh, reside above them, you know, all the way up to the fresh new leaves that are up at the top. Um, so this this whole design of our organization is really key, I think, to uh, producing some of the work that we have been uh, focused on. And as well, we this organization um, is interested in participating in our um, in our culture, in our civic engagement. Um, we oftentimes have dialogue within our office and invite outside people in just so that we can be able to speak the languages of others, not only 
between designers. So here um, at this eco salon, we, we also invited environmentalists and, and um, scientists and engineers to have a conversation about uh, the city. So one of the results of that is, are things that are books um, or papers or talks that might not just be um, aimed at our own architecture audience, like this one called Reverse Effect, which, which was really a, a book that we produced to help the public understand what was going on with the Chicago uh, waterways. And, and um, to move a dialogue forward, it was kind of timed to be released with some important policy decisions in the city. And um, um, we, we were able to you know, get that out to talk about some of these important issues. Um, which include things like the bad water quality in the Chicago River, the flooding of basements, the invasive species coming up the river, but also the potential of this kind of post-industrial riverscape. Um, and so in doing the research for this, we, we act uh, a little bit more like an industrial design firm, I guess, in terms of the way that we get information from people. We, we interview a lot of people, the users, um, and, and work on these things, really not knowing exactly where this, this study was going to go. Um, but what we, the results of the, the book and the, the research showed us that there was a way to, to um, advance thinking about this, this waterway in Chicago. Maybe some of you know that it's a, it's a river that was reversed about 100 years ago um, to, to flush the um, polluted river water downstream, which was an acceptable solution maybe for 100 years ago, but, but now we know that there are really um, some terrible results from that, like uh, the, the Gulf of Mexico um, experiencing kind of an, um, a dead zone in, in its water system due to some of this flushing of the Chicago waste. Um, so we, we kind of ended up designing a series of steps, you know, thinking about what, how this could be undone and how we could unreverse the Chicago River and, and start working toward it, uh, capturing the, the um, water, cleaning it, and putting it back into the lake. What I found fascinating was that um, the step number one that we were recommending, and I should say, this was all these steps were really researched with a big group of people and experts in, in water hydrology, et cetera. Um, but one of, the, one of the things, the first step was really to recommend the city acquire these industrial properties to get more land so that that land could eventually become um, a part of the wastewater cleaning. And at the same time, increase public access to the space we found out that people didn't really care about the river because they couldn't see it and they couldn't access it. Um, so to help people envision what it could be, we, we showed just what it looked like now. Um, and a lot of this industry, of course, is moving on, moving out, and what it could look like if this became really um, the last step of the wastewater treatment and unreversing the river, sending it back to the lake. Um, Sometimes things start, this book really started to move the needle and the discussion about the river. And you can see this, like, next time there was a, a mayoral election, uh, the new mayor, Rahm Emanuel, came in and wanted to really start with step number one, increasing public access to the river. And uh, the city, the Park District, commissioned four boathouses to give youth access to this, this waterway. Even though the, the water quality is bad, uh, the idea is that you still, if you can get people started, um, they are really going to be the new stewards for this. So um, we, we designed this first one, and, and the second one is under construction for um, a couple. It, it's a public um, park district facility. Um, it's managed by a couple of different crews that um, teach. They also teach classes there. and. Um, this building can also be used for public events up in this erg room. Um, but it really is about creating this portal to, to the river waterway. And I think what I, what I like a lot is to see how it has really already transformed um, how this river is, is being used and, and thought about. It was impossible just to get to it in the past. And, and now um, through this building, through architecture, something that is dynamic, um, 
people started to show up. We, we based the design on, on these kind of movement studies of Moybridge and looking at the, the ore movement in the water to kind of inspire the roof form, uh, which is made up of these two different truss types uh, that the, the, the elements between them are all straight, uh, but the results of changing between the two trusses produces this uh, warped surface um, it was a very low budget, and it had to also be done very quickly. Um, but it, it, and that's actually a good thing, I think. Many times it's a good thing to have a, a, a quick budget. This is an indoor row tank that we designed for the cold winter months. Um, but it, it really is great to have that short time frame because you, you really you don't have time to change your mind, I guess. And um, you can just go with it. Uh, so th this was the result, um, the project. We just won a National Design Award, which I was really proud of for that. Um, but it really gives me almost like goosebumps to see people using the river in this way. So uh, we tried to figure out, what do you call this, what we're doing? <laughs> it is architecture, but it's also um, activism, and it, it's also urbanism. and. Um, we, we came up with calling it actionable idealism, I guess, because we, 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 we are idealistic and we want to, to um, be true to ideas, but at the same time, we want to see them happen and the ideas get implemented. I guess the, the biggest problem with being an idealist is that you have to deal with a lot of people that are decidedly not idealists in, in our field of architecture, but. But um, I think the, the satisfaction of seeing these things happen is really what drives us and motivates us. Um, just to show another project that kind of had a similar trajectory for an urban uh, space um, to deal with water was the Lincoln Park Zoo Nature Boardwalk. And, and this was a project where the, um, there was a historic building on the site and a three foot deep pond that um, was very polluted and and really um, kind of a wreck. If you look at the, some of the earlier pictures of it, the edge was all broken down. And we were asked to put some fancy architectural pavilion on the site. Um, but when we approached the project, instead of uh, just responding to that brief, I think it was stepping back and looking at what could we do to this as a space in the middle of a city to make it more productive, to make it um, more of a, a habitat and more of a um, something that's working on multiple levels. Uh, so w working with hydrologists, um, we found that we could, if we deep, deepen the pond from three feet to 10 feet, you could really improve the water quality and also allow animals to overwinter there as, um, and you know, essentially use the runoff water to replenish this pond. Um, and so it's now, this is, I think it's the fourth year, um, and it really has been transformed into a, a really more vibrant habitat. The, the pavilion itself, though, is a key piece. Um, they needed something that they could cover uh, the space for students to have classes there. Um, and this is the bent wood, um, prefabricated wood elements we used for creating the pavilion, which has these fiberglass pod over it um, to allow light to come into the space as well. And even though this building is not really, um, it's not movable or kinetic, it is very interactive. People really, a lot of people send me pictures of their kids in these little holes and, um, and it's really quite um, dynamic. So it is used for education and yoga and marriages for architects and uh, many di different things. Um, and it's, it's quite engaging. Um, and it's really, at the same time, a stormwater reservoir. So it, it holds all of this water. So it's keeping water out of people's basements. Um, and it's a pretty biodiverse space that's smack in the middle of the city. So this wild nature, introducing that into the center of the city. So we have um, now about 400 nesting pair of these black crowned night herons and also um, as well as a home for coyotes, which is actually good um, because they are keeping the rat population down and they're, um, they, they're very 
you know, they don't eat dogs, as people sometimes fear. Uh, but they are actually a, a, one of the largest mammals that is uh, successfully being able to adapt to urban environments. I think they, they um, survive on about a six block radius. But also this, this has been used for, for a dance. And, and I think one of, one of the most important things for urban space is just like creating something that you can't even predict how it will be used. And, and that, that flexibility for urban environments is really key. They recently had a dinner there, Diné and Blanc, that the French tradition of having people out and, and eating on the boardwalk. Um, but I think when I felt really that the building was, um, the building in the space, but the building in particular was kind of embedded in the, in the mind of, of um, the public was when I went to Whole Foods one day and found this bottle of wine that had the, <laughs> the building on the front cover of it. Um, but anyway, it, it is, the image of the building is important. Um, I think one of the other really main points that we have been trying to address is, is the idea of the tall building in the city and the density of urban environment with, with tall buildings and with, with more dense um, living. In a way, if you don't address residential architecture, I almost feel like there's a big gap there that is such a important part of the DNA of a city. So the, the fact that you can really reduce the footprint of inhabitation uh, by, by, by building up and taller um, is, is evidenced by um, the fact that we take so much more less land and also a, a lesser um, carbon footprint. It, the, the data um, that we used here from the Center for Neighborhood Technology shows that about people living in the city have about seven times less carbon footprint than if you live in the more spread out pattern. So we've been really studying tall buildings. And they, they, this is a diagram of kind of the morphology, of starting with the aqua tower, which was the first one. We, we started to kind of try to articulate the ideas of each of these buildings, um, whether it be carving them for solar access or using wind uh, as a driver. Um, and, and then what happened was, with because tall buildings is very particular type of building and type of process, it, it, it actually helps to have um, a whole battery of designs that you've already thought about when you, when you go in to propose something. And so they've kind of sorted out throughout um, based on climate and culture. Um, I think in all, probably we've designed about maybe 19 or 20 that have gotten to the DD stage. Of course, only, only a couple of those are built or under construction. Um, this one, this is, this is actually a pretty tall building, but it's, it's um, more horizontally um, delineated. It's, it's the um, City Hyde Park, a residential tower in um, Hyde Park, which is a southern, it's, it's a neighborhood of Chicago where the University of Chicago is. Um, and, and this building, Really, we started designing it almost right on the heels of Aqua, but then it went on a big hold during the 2008 um, economic crisis. Um, and, and this, but then suddenly it was revived, and now it, it's, it got built in, in no time. So um, what we wanted to do here was kind of improve on the performance of, of Aqua, but also um, Think about how the, the building has two different sides, a north side and a south side. Um, a lot of our work uses, expresses the structure. So the, the literal structure is part of the design, uh, the design language. And here we use this alternating uh, structural concrete panel um, to allow us to create bay windows that have no columns in the, in the bay. So you get a very, very big open uh, bay there. And, and on the south side, we had um, this idea that we could take the concrete panel structure and use it in different ways to create these balcony stems. And, and so they're, they're literally creating almost more of like a community feeling on the facade. 
So that, that whole idea was to disengage the balcony from the building, um, and that allows us to get the thermal break in there, which is what I'm sure the students found out that, that doesn't perform as well on, on the aqua tower. And so here we, we see the, the way that these uh, balcony stems are coming down and meeting the ground. And so th th this is using structure. You can see it under construction here. Of course, we're now insulating the whole outside of this building, but um, you can see the north-facing facade coming up um, and the alternating column grids around the side and, and oops, and the looking up at the um, south side. So what's really interesting, though, is it creates this very spatial condition um, on the south side of the building, which also gives shading, but um, a kind of um, an architecture, instead of just thinking of a view, a straight up view, an architectural uh, feeling of space out beyond your um, window, um, a space that can be occupied. And, and this is, I think, right here, you can see our whole, we, we went and, uh, right before they started to open it and took a picture of our whole office standing on all the balconies. But I guess we're kind of small. You can't really see, <laughs> see us on there. Uh, but, but it really did have this incredible um, effect. We, we could see each other obliquely, but not see into each other's apartments. Um, and it was really a great experiment to do on the building. As, as well, this idea of solar carving is, is something that um, maybe it, it started with the aqua tower, but now we are taking it to a different level in a, in a new building that's just about to go into construction, um, which we call the solar carve building. You know, if you think about Manhattan, it really is evidence of solar carving, you know, carving down to create light and air to go to, go to the street. Um, these are the Hugh Ferris uh, drawings that represented zoning in, in New York that created the step back skyscraper. But there was another uh, professor, Professor Knowles, at, I think he was at USC, who I was really interested in early on, who had looked at how solar um, shaping could, could um, benefit neighborhoods. So instead of thinking about you know, the solar access for inside the building, it's really about thinking about how you could zone a whole neighborhood to provide solar access. So the building I'm going to show you is, at first glance, it looks um, like it's not doing the solar carving, because um, on the left, you can see the, the Hugh Ferris step back skyscraper rendition. And then on the right is our solar carved tower in, in New York. Um, but this comes out of, of looking very specifically at, at the site and analyzing the site very closely. Um, here you can see the as of right zoning if we were to build on our little L-shaped site there along the High Line um, with, with the, the zoning envelope around it. Um, and that would produce a building like this, um, which is really kind of closing in on the High Line and shading the, the gardens there. And, and so because the High Line is an interior block public space as opposed to um, a street, public street, um, it really makes you have to rethink the zoning. And so what we, we argued for uh, was to um, transfer that, that um, area and give ourselves a taller building, but cut away and shape uh, the building to provide light, air, and views to the High Line itself. So the shape really comes out of uh, thinking of the the solar angles and, and projecting them onto the building. And then we, we had to have a, a kind of a contingency plan because we were asking for more area as well. Um, and so we had a, you know, versions of the, just carving it further and further and further until we would meet the, the FAR that met the approval. Um, and one of, one of the things I learned about you know, working in New York was that they have like three architects. The first one does the zoning. The second one is the architect who figures out what it looks like. And the third one they call the envelope stuffer, which puts the insides into the, <laughs> into the building. Um, but our client in this case was, um, it was their first project, first development project. And so they didn't actually get the zoning envelope architect to, and so we, we ended up in a way, having a lot more freedom to, to explore this. Uh, we did get approved by the city. They understood that it's better to carve the building back toward the High Line. 
and they actually are starting a process whereby they will um, adjust the zoning for the future. Um, we had this carved areas are made out of a kind of faceted uh, glass, uh, which of course you have to optimize. Oops. Oh, sorry about that. I think it will be okay. Yay. <laughs> um, uh, so optimizing the, the um, see, don't panic. You never panic. That's, that's, a, that's a key lesson. <laughs> but making the optimization of these um, panels really to make it possible to bring it in budget. These are some of the, the study models that we did. And that, like I said, that's going to start construction this summer. We're really excited about uh, finally getting to see this building uh, start becoming a reality. Um, at, at Kalamazoo, we were asked to design a center for social justice leadership on a small campus whose um, primary architecture is a kind of a colonial style, <laughs> which doesn't really go with social justice. So, but anyway, um, we, um, we, we still were asked to try to make the building fit in, and, um, it, but the, the client, the college, understood that this had to be something different. And then as we started to do our research and look for, you know, what, what would a social justice center be, there really wasn't any example of specifically of that that we could find. It's not like a library or, you know, or a, a classroom building, a normal classroom building. And so th this was really a, an experiment and, and study about finding what does it mean to have, what is social justice? What does it mean when it's an urban space? What does it mean in a building? Um, and so we started to do a lot of uh, research. This was going on at the time um, in Tahrir Square, where there was almost like this self-organized uh, space that set up within the, the city, um, which was very quite interesting. And then um, looking at a lot of the work of MLK and you know the places where social justice activities are planned have always been in these basements. This is the basement of the. 16th Street Baptist Church, where um, MLK planned some of the um, marches, but they're usually like unseen places. And the college really wanted this to be a program that would be out and really proud and visible. That led us to, to looking at a lot of different kind of meeting spaces around the world, um, and a lot of them are organized around fire or light, uh, water, and and, and face, kind of face inward, like in a meeting type way. Um, and so at the same time we were looking at, at the internal organization, we also wanted to be visible. Um, so these three large windows are facing out toward the different environments around the, around the building, which includes the, the university context, a small neighborhood, small houses, and, and a grove. And so these th three different um, kind of trifoil plan is what set up our, our plan um, with a central space that can open up and be, uh, become one big events, event space with smaller meeting rooms around the edge in that poche area uh, to allow for a lot of different ways of meeting and convening. Um, as we were studying the plan and studying the relationships, uh, we, we started to think about the, the exterior walls of, and what the building would be made out of. It's not going to be brick. And, and really started looking at wood. Uh, there's a white cedar in the Michigan area that's very resistant to rot and also bugs. And that at one of the times we were driving up to Michigan, we, we saw this barn, which was incredible, um, you know, using the wood as a masonry um, technique. This is a hundred-year-old barn, and we found uh, a couple other buildings that, that were um, in relatively good shape, given they probably have no maintenance, maintenance whatsoever. Um, so I guess you know you're an architect when you get excited about this kind of stuff, <laughs> and uh, we, we basically had to find a, um, someone who knew how to use, do this technique, which is almost lost, um, called cordwood masonry. 
Um, and we found this couple um, that's them in the background. Um, and, and they they were building saunas and things like that around the country and teaching people how to do this. So that so we, we as an office went and learned how to do it and we brought our contractors with us. Um, and so, because it was really gonna be a challenge to convince a college to uh, employ a technique that, you know, is kind of a lost heritage technique uh, and bring it into the 21st century. What we were appealed to us though was the, the idea that the the, each of the trees is unique and individual, kind of like a person's face. You know, the, the lines, the, the rings on the tree represent what um, the water was like, what the, what the weather was like that year. And so the, the college, our client really loved the idea and, and wanted to help us, you know, make it to the finish line. Um, as well, we were interested in trying to different things with the technique as well. Um, what we found was after the builders knew how to do it, it was, it was really about specifying it to be beautiful and uh, to, be, um, to, to aesthetically meet our desires, but also um, to be something that could be done quickly so that the, the, college could, the, the college could move in when they were supposed to move in. Um, and, and I think the other thing we really liked about the technique was just that it's almost like taking carbon out of the atmosphere because if you think about it, each tree is is absorbing carbon as it as it grows, and then you're not really like over processing this um, wood. You're just letting it dry, um, and then putting it into the wall as a kind of carbon sink. And this came out beautifully. The idea is, is it will weather it will weather differently on the different facades. Um, um, there was some participation by all different um, diverse groups throughout the entire process for the building of this too. So it really embodies the social justice uh, mission. Um, so inside it's really open and light uh, with a central fireplace that people can meet in. This is a little um, closet area as, you, as the public comes in. And there are offices and different kinds of meeting spaces. There's a big lecture hall that faces the grove uh, to the south. Um, and it's been open now for only about, like, this is the second year, and they've really begun, this college is using this building as like their main um, recruiting tool, and their program is growing, um, really because it's so important to have architecture play that role of, as, as a kind of, um, it's, it's an iconic center for, for their program. Uh, this is one of the seminar rooms, and that's the, the window, the, the eyelet window that, that we have there. So this is the first year in their um, first conference. So um, I was really excited about how this came out. Even though it's small, it was about taking this um, technique and, and seeing how we could um, apply it to, to making a 21st century building. Um, and then I just I want to show the most recent project that we just completed, which is called the the Writers Theater. Um, and this this is one that um, it's a, it's again it's kind of a small project. It's about thirty eight thousand square feet, and located in in Glencoe, Illinois, which is a, a little bit north of Chicago, in this leafy quiet suburb um, that's located right on the the commuter train to downtown Chicago. Um, we were asked to design a, a theater for, for this company that was, they were performing in, in the back of a bookstore, basically, a very tiny, um, tiny little venue. And they were also, they had another venue in a, in a ladies' library club in town. But they had built a very strong following for their intimate performances, and they wanted us to, um, to, to help them build a new home. Um, what, what we saw as the urban kind of challenge here was to try to, to insert, use the arts to kind of engage the, the, this village and make it more uh, um, walkable and make it more so that people could um, start to, to participate in urban lifestyle. Uh, up till then, it was, it's really been a car-oriented um, society. Even though they have a couple of small shops, uh, most people drive everywhere. So, we felt like we needed to engage the, 
the city and, and bring the theater um, outward. So if you, you know, if you look back at theater, there's uh, really some great examples of, of theater without any buildings at all that just happened directly in the streets. And then in Shakespeare's time, really, the, the courtyards were the big um, theaters were open air. And, and all of those related very strongly to the urban context. Uh, so in, in ours, which is this writer's theater here, we wanted to create a couple of venues, but then create a third venue that's really operating uh, more as a, a public space, some early sketch. Um, and looking back at the material, you know, uh, what, what should this building be made out of? Um, we really came across this idea of the, the frame and timber uh, during that modern era, the first modern era of theater was um, the same time, corresponded to the same time as the Tudor buildings, which Mies really looked at a lot because they were like the first time you had a frame building with infill instead of bearing wall structures. But we wanted to, you know, take that wood technology further and um, um, came up with some really interesting ways to employ wood. Um, so the, the venues are here, the little black box, a 250-seat theater, and then this lobby space that doubles as a, as a performance space, an urban public space, with a walkway that, that surrounds it, almost like a canopy walk um, for this, um, to look at the adjacent sit, uh, parks. And so as we were developing the wood, the, the canopy walk and the, and the, the wood Virendil uh, structure, uh, we, we were trying to use the wood intention to hold up this walkway. And um, what's interesting about using wood structurally is a lot of codes now don't let you actually do that because the codes are written for steel and concrete. Um, and we're really pushing it here with, with using very thin members, tendons that would hold up this walkway. Um, um, the engineers that we started out with were really good at steel and, and didn't really know wood, so we brought in um, a specialist in wood construction um, and, and figured out a way to hold this walkway up in, in tension using this detail at the base. And so a lot of it had to be incredibly, um, it had to be modeled uh, digitally and tested for all different kinds of conditions because it wasn't, um, it wasn't described in the code how you could use wood this way. But the real challenge was finding the right people to make it um, and to get it, you know, get it on the, to meet the budget. We ended up finding this incredible place in, in um, the middle of nowhere, really, um, where a lot of craftsmen have come from all over the world to work with wood and work with it. And they've also, um, go around and, and kind of deconstruct barns and, and to, to try to salvage wood. This is the site right here where, where these, this box was made, essentially. Um, so again, I think connecting to the making is really important to us. I, and I, I, I mean, I love that part of, of architecture. And I, I really want to combine the, um, the tools of the, the highest digital tools with actually like you know, the physical material. And so this place, uh, we, we had to do a, a test to prove that our screen would work. Um, we, we went out there a number of times. This is showing the, the rig that, where they actually pulled the, um, the tendons apart. You can see how thin they are. This is, this is a Port Orford cedar um, tendons. That is a, it's a cedar that will weather, but it also has very few knots in it. Um, and it surpassed the test that actually the steel started to break, creak, <laughs> and so uh, before the wood did. And so it was really a great um, test. And then the, the detail of how to express this tension member um, we did with this um, special, we call it cat's paw. Uh, so it's, it's uh, the solid baton goes into the slot. Here's, uh, an ex here's an example. They let us actually help uh, make some of these, which was, was great. Um, adding material into the, um, into the um, baton instead of taking a bolt. You know, and if you put a bolt through a small piece of wood, you're going to take out 75% of the material. And so this was really a great way to um, 
bolster the connection, um, and there's a finished one. One of the other things I learned from going out there was like how to throw an axe. This is um, <laughs> they have a, a these. It's an amazing place. They make their own beer and they they throw axes. But anyway, um, the the detail came out incredible. This is um, um, showing that you can really see the the structure there. How is that? It looks like strings holding it up, but um, it, it's it communicates what the structure is doing, which I really like. So I, as I said, this just opened like two weeks ago. Um, the first performance is in, in March. This is, this is a view from the park, seeing the um, canopy walk going around the building. Here's, here's another view of that. So it, it's an outdoor space that can be used uh, at the intermission, but it also has this play, way to open up to the space, the lobby space below. Uh, which is here coming into the building, um, and then the space, which which can be both an impromptu performance, but also um, um, just a public uh, place for for lectures before and after theater, um, and a space that was kind of really needed in in the small city. So this is it's kind of the views of it. This is being up in in the canopy. Um, it's it's very light. Um, this is the rehearsal space. This is the main stage uh, where we actually reused the, we took a building down off the site and reused the brick here in, in an acoustic wall in the back. So very excited about this building as well. Even though it's small, we feel like it, it can start to have an impact on its space around it. So finally, just getting back to this actionable idealism idea, the idea that architects can do something that is in addition to designing buildings that where you're given a program like this one, there, there can always be a reassessment of that, that program. But you can also self-initiate project and, and if you're interested in, in doing something and a lot of people that um, are working in this more blurred space of what an architect is actually do um, self-initiate projects. Um, the one that we most recently did and is now take, going on to the next step, it, it, we called Polis Station. Um, and th this was a, a project that really uh, resulted from us watch, you know, basically looking at what was going on in the country, watching the news, and being rather horrified by uh, the violence going on between police and community members and a kind of almost like a disconnect between uh, these two groups and um, kind of just wondering if, if there was something in the urban space or in the building, police station itself, that could help to mend some of that, uh, that tension. A lot of people ask me, what it, what, why do you call it polis station? Or you know, what, what does that mean? But it really comes from the Greek word of polis, obviously, and, and the idea that um, a polis station, it should be a place that's for, by the, for the people. Um, and and it, it should help to reinforce a tightly knit community. So um, one thing is, polis, uh, the Polis Station, when, when people talk about these self-initiated projects, it's, sometimes it's hard to uh, understand what's going on, what drives that. And we kind of tried to delineate it here with this diagram. So <laughs> this is kind of a diagram of, of the actionable idealism. So sometimes the, the ideas get hatched um, because of things that are going on in the world. Um, there, you might, it might be because of people you meet. Um, it might be from teaching a studio or you know, working with, with an institution. So for, for Polis Station, I, I happened to be, I was um, teaching a studio at Columbia last, last semester. Um, but also we had been designing this firehouse in New York, and it, it, it was striking me how the firehouse is such a community-oriented building, and then when you look at police stations, they look like, you know, fortresses, and, and the, also that the firemen, firefighters oftentimes have relationships with the community and each other, and that's the, exactly the relationship that's broken down between police and their community, and so that was also feeding into it. Um, and so we started to we started on our research phase, which includes 
really talking to people. Again, like people who build community. Uh, we, we were talking to scholars uh, on criminal justice. We were talking to the police. We were talking to government and community members. And, and, and as all of those people and those interviews start coming together, um, we start to hatch you know, a project, a, a project that would be about a new type of police station. And, and simultaneously, one of, the, one of the things that came out in this prep area, prep time, was, was thinking about what could we actually get built and so this thing doesn't just stay on paper. So, so we, we started to, um, um, and that, we started to basically raise money to, to start um, funding one of the components of the project. Um, we were looking at this report from President Obama's task force on 21st century policing, which um, uh, the Obama administration started this study um, after a lot of these violent um, interactions and, and killings. And they came up with six pillars of how to improve policing and make it 21st century. And the pillars are really, you know, it's, it's, they're quite strong and very good ideas. Um, however, none of them have anything to do really with architecture or design. And so I think that really we felt like this could be a brief. And then how do we um, test architecture, urban design against these um, pillars? So going backwards, looking at what, what is policing, why did it end up like this, and how did we get here? Uh, we, we found that really policing, which comes from England for the US, and I got to preface this with we're only talking about kind of the Northeast because it's a very different thing in the South and it's a very different thing in the West. But the policing idea came from you know, someone in the neighborhood who lives there would go around and have this night watch. And they would, the building is nothing but a box, this tiny little box in the background. And so it, it looks like an outhouse, really. But it was just a little warming hut. And, and people would take turns um, um, walking around. And they would meet at predetermined times in the box and so to, to relieve each other from duty. And they knew the community, and the community knew them. And these boxes were located really within walking distance of each other. Um, so you, you, you have a city based on this um, really direct communication between you know, the people, the pr protectors, and the community that they're protecting. And later on, that became more of a, um, a, this telephone box. So still really not a building in sight, but, but as, as police started using cars and um, but the buildings became more and more surrounded by parking and they became fortresses and jails. So you know, a lot of time these places right now are, are operating as jails. Um, people are scared to walk in the front door basically to, to the police, but the, the thing that the big potential of it is that they're located in, in the neighborhoods. So you have a publicly you know, paid for building that is an asset in, in the middle of a neighborhood. And, and at this point, you know, we started looking at um, a specific example. This is in, in North Lawndale in Chicago. In the interviews, one of the things we heard was the police, uh, to, get, to create better relationships, uh, the police really want to be involved with kids in the neighborhood. But there's a lot of barriers against that because um, they are asked to be coaches, but the, the teams play far away, and the police don't no longer live in the neighborhood that they're policing, and so it's very hard to do. So, so one of the things that we thought of that could be easy to, to achieve would be to take this parking all around this police station and just introduce some play courts, some, some bring the teams to the police station um, to create this a uh, relationship that's not about law and not about enforcing laws, but it's more about creating um, a sense of community and getting to know each other. Uh, this is a little bit of the North Lawndale site. This is the way it looks. As you can see, the, the urban renewal, uh, this police station's here, and it's just, I mean, I don't know if they could ever use all these parking spots. We pitched this to the city at the same time we really um, were ongoing with the project, and we found that there was a really strong desire to, to um, do something here. 
Um, this is all like pre, um, pre the latest scandal that came out um, in, in Chicago, and this is the city really wanting to do something and realizing that they needed to. And so they were able to secure a, a connection with us, with the police, and uh, to, to get something going on, the, like a court on one of those parking lots. So anyway, we started to associate different design ideas with these policy recommendations and, and really found out that our project had to be more about this whole entire neighborhood and not just about the police station itself. Um, we had a facilitated um, community meeting with um, where the questions were, if the police station was more than a police station, what could it be? So, and, and we heard from a lot of the community members that they really wanted to go maybe use the police station for various community things, but um, were afraid to do so. So out of that came this idea that the police station would become a community center and that um, there could be a way for, there could be a secure side and a public side a uh, way for this to be much more of a community asset. Uh, we, we showed this project in the, um, the first architecture uh, biennial in Chicago, um, and it drew, it was great as a venue for this kind of self-initiated project because we were able to also have a lot of public discussions about the issue, something very timely, and, and, and really show a, a wider audience, not just architects, um, what, how design could enter into this dialogue. So, so the, the one of the, the first you know, steps, well, the, the idea of wellness and safety between, um, for the officers, but also creating shared community fil uh, facilities was about creating this basketball court, which uh, we, like I said, we got started. And, and in fact, it was complete by the time uh, the biennial opened. And, and it really started to be used a lot immediately. The whole idea, though, is to get the police to use it together with the community, and that, that remains to be seen, but we are following it. So th this work is continuing on. We, we were approached afterwards by the, um, uh, uh, the Knight Foundation and were awarded a big grant, actually, to study five cities, and in the, the first one being Philadelphia, um, looking at how uh, the, the different civic a assets of that city in a certain neighborhood uh, would be able to start to inform uh, a new kind of police station. So with that, uh, I'd like to conclude and, and ask if, if you have any questions. I'm happy to answer them, and, and thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, when when I started the um, the office, it was I was um, it really was it was something I always wanted to do, but I, I um, went and got experience, got licensed, um, and. I started, it was really just one person, my, myself, me, myself, and I, and, um, and this laptop, but it was probably bigger. Um, but, but it was really just, um, um, it was a real drive to, to get it started. And, and with the first couple people that joined me were my students from IIT, actually, who started teaching there. Um, um, but, but right away, I saw that, you know, there, there were, there were gaps in between what was given to us a, as a program, you know, like here's a community center to design versus what, what the building could actually do or what the ecological, let's say, uh, context of any project is. And that there was a gap to, between, you know, this, this desire of the client to build a building and then what, what was really the bigger issue and is there any way that you can get out beyond the, the design brief? And 
to try to be more impactful. So th that started, I think the first project I had was a small community center in Chinatown um, and also this small community theater in, on a college, um, uh, like a, a college campus out in the, in the Rockford area. And both of them may, were, were projects that were a standalone brief, but they, each one of them seemed like there was something that they could be doing more than, than just following that brief. And um, as I grew the practice and um, was joined by, by others, there was very common, there's a common um, sustainability and environmental ethos. And so we, we were very involved with NGOs and, and not-for-profits like the NRDC, for example, and, and doing some work with them. Um, and so th those relationships um, help, I guess it helped us to start to see where we could um, go in between the buildings and, and do some of these other projects. So it, it's, it's changed in that now, now we have, we can help, um, we can design our own future, I guess, by, by pulling together different clients that, that we already work with or by knowing like, how we can interact with the city um, in various places. So, so currently, like doing a project like the last one I showed um, is now, allowing us to, to work in a space. I don't think, I, I don't really want to design a police station, <laughs> you know, but, but I think that, you know, there's a strategic asset there that is located in, throughout neighborhoods in every city. And, and if we can figure out what to do with them, it might be able to uh, really help some of the other issues we care about, like inequity and sustainability and, and reducing violence and things like that. So. I guess it kind of evolved over time, but um, most of the people that come work for us now are really in, into that, and they they want to um, be engaged with the city that they're in, and so it, it's 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 kind of multiplying now. I think that um, it's a good question. Then I, you know, I've in some, sometimes I will talk, you know, just about living. It's really more, not really just tall buildings, but living environments in the city. I think the um, the thing I'm really interested in there is is like this issue of community. When we first came into the space of tall buildings, that was not a discussion point. I mean. The whole idea is trying to create more privacy, privacy in the city, which, yeah, you need privacy. Um, but I think people really are also looking for community. And again, it's, you have all of these people living on a small footprint. Um, there's great opportunities to create those, those kind of shared spaces. Um, a, a current building we're doing that's, that's also tall, uh, it's about it's 18 stories at the University of um, Chicago, it's a residence hall. Um, we took like every three floors and created a void in, inside that's like a, a house stuck into the, the section. Um, so that was another way of trying to create that community space within the building. Um, but I also really, I, I like that problem because it's, it's got such limit. It is a very challenging um, uh, design problem to do, design tall buildings. It, there's so much, it's like a vertical street with so much pressure on the core. So in a way, we like having it in the mix because it's, it's just, and some people gravitate to it in the, within the office. Um, um, it's, it's, it's got such tight parameters and it's such an important thing in, in a city to have people living there. Again, when we first started, not, not that many architects were really well, commercial architects were looking at it, but not that many design-oriented um, architects. And so um, I hope that is changing, and I'm so glad about that, because um, you need spaces that are compelling to live in in a city, especially if you're trying to 
in a city that might be shrinking, which was the, the condition in Chicago where um, you're trying to, to attract people in from the suburbs, empty nesters, or getting people to live downtown. It's a little bit different in cities like New York where it's like, you know, really just about trying to find enough ground to put it on. Um, so I think it's attractive because of the, again, the, just the challenge of it, um, the puzzle-like nature of it, but also the kind of importance of it, and, which is different in different cities. Um, it's also challenging to, to achieve like sustainability in those buildings as well. The, it, so little by little, you know, figuring out ways to do it. I think we're coming out with a paper on uh, the City Hyde Park project in terms of using the thermal break, um, um, and, and we're, we're going to be um, measuring between a couple. We did a couple units without it and with it to see if that actually is really um, like changing the energy use inside of each of the buildings. So there's kind of a whole other trajectory of research on, on that tall building side. Yes. There are many things that are remarkable about your work, but what I see for the first time today is a dimension of it that I hadn't seen before, which is the connection with uh, larger infrastructural projects and uh, site recovery, particularly the strategies towards uh, soft infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And what is extremely remarkable about your approach is that the soft, the soft infrastructure does not lead to soft architecture, unlike much of what we have seen. In other words, the architecture does not get dissolved or challenged, as mm -hmm. it, but we lead to. Mm -hmm. uh, and in many of the cases, particularly the ones along the Chicago River, the retooling in, uh, involves a rethinking of certain types, certain typologies mm -hmm. of things, uh, not in order to throw them out, but to revise them mm -hmm. and put them back there as public equipment that are part of this larger set. And when you presented the police station, I was hoping that I would see two, so that I understand your attitude towards time. Mm -hmm. Is it replicable? Because in every case, there's a reinvention of the time. Yes. So I want to see, yes. okay, if we see two of them, would they look alike? Mm -hmm. Would they be a common strategy? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good question. I think what, what um, is really interesting about the poli police stations in general is they are so individual. Uh, like when we think of a courthouse, you know, there is a common idea of, even with the modern ones, what a courthouse should be in our democracy, right? But because police stations grew up from these boxes and, and really they became different things in different cities, and we also have these kind of three distinct regions between the South, the Wild West, and the East, um, the, the, the whole activity of policing is, is very particular in each place. So I think what we ended up realizing is the design for that is, is the design of the process to get to, to get to what it is that a, a community needs. It, it really takes that, that type of process to get there. Um, and, and using the principles as the program would be perfectly fine in any condition. But I think the results would be different based on which city it's, it's in and which neighborhood it's in. You know, obviously, we're looking at neighborhoods that have uh, a high level of poverty and also high level of crime. Because why put a brand new rethought police station in, in a place if, if, I mean, this is, this is the problem that we're trying to address. So, but still, communities are different. And so I think it really is going to take our, all of us architects to, to understand how to engage the public. And I know that's like a lot of architects really don't like that idea very much, but it is so important, especially for this particular type of project. And I'm actually learning how to do it better and better. I, I, and we've brought people into our, our organization that are really uh, good at that. And there's also mechanisms um, that you can use to, to have good public meetings that are productive. But I, I do think that's like a whole new frontier that we should all be thinking about how to master it and to, to be better at that. Um, so to answer your question, I, I don't think 
they would look uh, the same or the problems are not going to be the same. But in this particular place in North Lawndale, um, there's a lot of abandonment. There's, um, there's um, lack of, of amenities. There's no places for people to use computers. So that's like a kind of a, an easy idea of like putting computers in. And that's what the people told us, that we want computers. One guy said, if we really want to repair the relationship between police and community members, we should put a barber shop in the police station. <laughs> and Because um, that's what works there. And so I would have never thought of that. you know. Um, and so it is, it is going to be particular and unique. And you know, the tough part is going to be getting the police to accept and move and try to uh, move toward this idea. So, um, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for really uh, an inspiring talk. Um, I, I recall the Frank Lloyd Wright's advice to young architects: if you want to start your practice. Try to build as far away from your hometown as possible. <laughs> so if you make mistakes, no one will know you. And what comes across, maybe, perhaps, that you're suggesting the opposite: that uh, we should embrace, I mean, architects should embrace the town that that they are working in or they're associated with. It's kind of going against the trend to kind of expand and build all over the world. Would you agree? I, I definitely would agree. I think it's. Um, I always felt like um, you, you, it's better to, to know a problem, but then once you, you really do know it and you can be on many different sides of it, there is a, a way to, to transfer that idea to another place and to, to let it be influenced by that place. Um, but, but getting your, you know, starting out as a young architect and thinking about what, you're, what gets you excited, what makes you really you know, staying up all night to think about it. Um, those are things that impact your own community and your own life. So it, I, I do think it's, it's maybe a, a total reversal of the trend, but, but, it, but starting with the local is, is, has, been, has been very, very good to us. <laughs> so um, um, now, of course, we are moving farther afield and, and but we have these things in place, like um, you, you, figuring out the, back to the police station, figuring out the process for how you would address something so volatile, like an issue like that, um, or even wanting to get involved with it in the first place. A, a lot of um, my colleagues within my office, especially the lawyer, said, you're crazy. <laughs> but, um, um, but, but, you know, if, if not us, then who is, who is going to, like, really start to look at this? So now I think the, the process for that kind of work is in place, and we're starting to be able to move it to a different cities. So, so thank, you. thank you. Thank <laughs> you.